Um, I'm going to um, go back to a, a comment. I think I don't know that it was a question, but it was a comment put in there earlier about um, framing the message. And, and all of us talked a lot about extension work. And one of our uh, listeners is, works with the conservation district. And um, so technically, he's not part of extension, university extension with a big E. But I see a lot of organizations that do a great deal of extension work, and I say that with a little e, in that they're working on bringing science into public use. And I see it more and more from conservation districts, from NRCS, from um, advocacy and service groups are, are doing a lot of that as well. And so I know the word extension was used a lot, but I, I believe it was pretty inclusive of a lot of other groups doing work in this area. And I'm just curious if any of the other speakers had a, uh, had a uh, comment on that. And I do appreciate you pointing that out, George, as, as well. Do, do any of you have a comment on um, the audience and where, this, where these principles can be put into use? I agree with you, Jill. I, I'm sorry that I misspoke and thought that most of the people on the call were um, from Extension, but you're absolutely right. Many of the state and federal agency folks do a lot of interacting with the public, and anytime they do that, these kinds of education, educational programs, then I think all of these principles and ideas are totally relevant. Yeah, yeah ditto, ditto, nothing to add. This is Paul. Yeah. Great. So yeah, thanks for pointing that out to us, Judge. And that's probably an error on my part for not describing who would be on this call to the speakers perfectly well, but I'm glad you brought that up. Um, another comment here, and I think this was during your presentation, Paul, but I might have Crystal address it. It was on the, um, the, the slide you had on the amount of greenhouse gases emitted per cow rising over time, but then the amount per kilogram of milk going down over time. and um, there was a question on what factors contribute to the increase in greenhouse gases per cow. Um, did you want to address that, or did you want me to throw that over to Crystal or, or myself? Well, um, yeah, I, I guess I, I, I am going to ask for Crystal's help on that. Um, what, uh, you know, just to uh, uh, reinforce what I was uh, trying to illustrate was, um, I, I mean, I think it, I think there's validity in, the, in 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 that calculation. I mean, really, ultimately, we care about the the harvested and consumed products. So the the, the less greenhouse gas per product, um, you know, there's 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 value in 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 that. Although maybe there's still ways to improve sustainability. I don't want to excuse every practice of what we might be doing, but but uh, but I do think the important point is to talk to growers about climate change. I mean, they. they so many of them reject the topic outright, and so we've got to find ways to um, to make to make it mean to, to keep them listening, to make it a legitimate topic. And so that's that's why I, uh, you know, I particularly like to point the, that kind of a calculation out. And we we see the same thing with with you know really grain production as well. There's there's been uh, reductions on a per bushel basis in greenhouse gas emissions. Over the decades, yeah. Crystal, what uh, what would you like to add? Um, well, the the specifics of why on a per cow it's gone up is because our cows are producing a lot more milk um, on an individual basis. So to do that, they are much bigger. They eat a lot more feed, um, and they generally just have a lot more um, biological processes going on. And so to to make all that milk, they themselves um, are burping more methane, they're producing more waste. Um, and so on a per cow basis, there um, there's just more emissions. But like you said, on a on an overall basis, so we need fewer cows um, to produce the same amount of milk. And so what you're really seeing is that less of the cow's energy is going to maintain just maintaining herself. You know, keeping herself warm, you know, moving around, so, so let, a smaller percentage is going to that, and so she's more efficient at producing milk from a greenhouse gas standpoint. I think those two, those two graphs are also a great example of how both graphs are true. Both pieces of information are accurate. 
And an advocate or someone with a worldview is more likely to see and remember only one of them and then convey that one to somebody else who knows the other side and then they can't talk to each other because they have completely different information in their heads. Mm -hmm. And so for extension or other kinds of educators to be aware of the diversity of ways this information is presented and how much of it is true but just different um, helps communicate a more neutral perspective because you can say this is true and turn it around and say this is true. Very good. Yes, thank you. I appreciate those, um, those as well. Um, there's a question here, and I think this one's for you, Paul. What are the reasons for the rejection of the WHO study on Roundup by some groups, given studies from WHO usually have a pretty comprehensive data set? Yeah. Um, yeah, there's been uh, some written on that. Actually, the best the best information on that uh, that I that I would point to is the European Food Safety Administration. Um, and and wh the, whoever asked that can email me, and I'll I'll find it if 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 they can't Google it so easily. But um, the, m many times I rely actually on uh, the European Food Safety Administration, and of course the FDA, but. But the European Food Safety Administration in, in this issue of genetic engineering has particular value, one, because they often do write out their responses to particular studies that might, you know, be raise some concerns, and, and, and uh, so they articulate their reasons, you know, in public documents. Uh, it took about six months for them to react uh, in, in, in public. Um, but, but the other reason I, I particularly like to uh, lean on some of their documents is because they – you know, the, Europe is, is, of course, the continent of no to GMOs. And, and uh, I think people, again, it, it creates that cognitive dissonance or opens the door a little bit to new information if people understand. And here's what the European regulatory community says. You know? and, uh, so, yeah, I, I don't remember the details, but I, I know it's a, it's, I, I skimmed it when I saw it, and it's, it's pretty well outlined in a document that was published within the last month. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, I'm going to throw this out to, to any of the presenters that would like to address it, but, uh, you know, you mentioned using high-impact imagery, and then we also need to avoid emotional appeal. What are your thoughts on that, that balance? How do you strike an appropriate balance between imagery and making sure it's not just emotional? Maybe I'll start with you, uh, Paul. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah, that's a very good uh, Question for discussion. It's a tough one. I I I, I think I think it's really critical to make sure that everything we say uh, is is well defensible by you know the, the current science. Um, so that's very important. Now, now let me give you an example. The the I I, I brought in that uh, slide of of the birth defects uh, from uh, fumonacin or made in, in uh, the risk of which is increased with uh, exposure to fumonacin. During pregnancy, and that that's an emotional slide. And I, I actually, I actually uh, had it peer reviewed because I, I really wanted an outside opinion. Is this an appropriate thing to show? And and my colleague who reviewed it said yes, as long as it's you know defensible. Um, you know, other people may disagree, but um, the, the fine line. It's a fine line, of course. What what motivates people? And I know this because of the social science I've read and. My uh, wife is a social scientist, but um, I know that what m motivates people is not information. They need that information. That's what our job is. But what motivates people is emotion. And so, I, you know, I thought, well, this is, you know, this is a legitimate truth. And, uh, and uh, you know, it, uh, if it's presented uh, honestly, um, you know, maybe, maybe it fits, you know, without, without going overboard. But some people, some good scientists may object to that, that particular slide. Yeah, I'll touch on it. Um, too. Oh, sorry. This is Crystal. I'll touch on it a little too. Paul and I had a great uh, discussion after our practice session about this too. Um, and I think just like he's saying, it, it's really finding a balance um, and being able to defend it with science. And what I'd add to that is, um, you know, kind of think about um, what are our motivations? So it's important to convey our passion for what we do. I mean, that builds trust in who you are for people to know um, that you're passionate about um, 
science to care about your clientele. So um, to a certain extent, you know, that, that's a positive, positive use there. But we also need to step back and look at what our own personal biases. Are we letting um, the images we use, are we trying to like steer the conversation in a particular direction? Um, which I said here again, it's a balance because if that's what the science is showing, that's probably an appropriate use. And I like Paul's approach of, you know, getting an outside opinion on it um, before you use it. And some of this is also just your personal comfort um, with uh, conveying emotion, your personal comfort with the science behind it. Um, but finding that balance is tricky. And there's, and there's a lot of value to using emotion. Um, what I was just trying to highlight is, is we have to be careful not to over, overuse it and not follow it up. Uh, some sort of, of science-based um, recommendation. Otherwise, it kind of just overwhelms people and they tend to tune out really quickly. Yeah, great point. Um, did you have anything to add, Martha, on that? Or uh, No, I agree with all that. Although, <laughs> yeah. I guess I, I could say that um, sometimes we don't know what's emotional or how things will be perceived until we start doing something and then we say, oops. <laughs> and so the whole idea of vetting information, letting other people respond to it, checking things out, getting feedback from others is really good. Yeah, I appreciate that. And I'm really enjoying seeing the information that's scrolling in that chat in the middle of the screen right now. I think there's some really great um, thoughts there as well. If you haven't scanned that or haven't contributed to that, please do because there's some nice um, Things there, and we'll probably present that as part of the, the archive as well. Um, and then there's, um, we only have time here probably for just a quick wrap-up here. Um, we've gotten a little bit past our hour, but this is good discussion, so I don't want to stop it right offhand here. But there's a, a, a question here on discussing the two graphs um, on the dairy cattle, you know, the one that said the emissions per cow and then the emissions per kilogram of milk. It shows both are true, but neither may be accurate for the question. If the question is, do cows produce more methane, the graph should be the total, the number of cows times the methane per cow or quantity of milk times emissions per gallon. And so what are your thoughts on making sure that you know, what we're presenting in our um, information is, is appropriate to the, the questions or, the, or, or even maybe sometimes acknowledging the limits of what we're presenting when we have, when we're confronted with questions from our audience as to what they want to know? Well, I'd say um, you really need to ask what's the follow-up question. So what are they trying to answer? Because um, sometimes the question that's asked, they might not even be asking quite the right question. Um, it's really essentially the same thing we see with the divergence on is there more herbicide use because of GMOs? Well, if you look at total, yes, but probably on a on a per bushel of corn, not. And so just for those of you on the cropping side, this is kind of an equivalent discussion. Um, and so it depends on what you're after. If you're if you're talking about total, you know, are we trying to reduce total emissions? then you might be interested in that, you know, what is the total coming from cattle? But if we're still saying that one of our mission, you know, our goals is to produce milk, we'll drink, um, I think what we're really after is improving the efficiency with which we produce that milk. And so then, you know, the real question is, is how much greenhouse gas per unit of product? And it's kind of the same, um, you know, with a lot of different metrics. And that's, you know, that's a challenging part of statistics and, and the data side is that they can be manipulated very easily. And so it kind of depends on the question that, that the person's really after is where I'll, I'll leave it there. <laughs> yeah, it's great. The, and that's, I would agree with what you said, Crystal. That's part of what we're hoping in a dialogue is, is to not just get these questions, but to be really listening to what people are wanting to know. Um, we spoke a lot about our message, how we frame it, how we, how we really try to present things to people. 
And one of the really important lessons that maybe 